Great. Uh, I want to just continue, start the discussion right now, uh, but maybe, because there's a lot to talk about, I think, and be, I look forward to, to that opportunity. Um, in the meantime, uh, I do have a few things to say, maybe to you. First, to thank Wendy for bringing us together and inviting me to join you, um, and to join this very interesting and, and surely ongoing conversation, um, to which I really only have to offer some history uh, this morning, uh, most of which I think many of you already know, and some old theory, uh, which I think also you know pretty well. Um, nevertheless, I, I do hope that that can help, uh, help explain what we might mean by the term media. So we have the term you know, organized, but there's also the problem of the term media, and, and uh, for me specifically coming from a, a field supposedly outside of whatever it is that media studies studies, uh, this is an interesting question. Maybe it's not interesting to you, I don't know. Anyway, so uh, as, I, as <laughs> Timon said, and I will say again, media organize. Um, and by this, uh, I mean that, that by definition, um, we could have had the same introduction in a sense, uh, media construct patterns, relational complexes, that pose the question of order. They ask us to ask, is there order there or here? Uh, if so, what is its form? What is its source? So opening the field of media archaeology and media studies beyond their classical subject matter, let's say, gramophone, film, typewriter, their precursors, descendants, etc., um, we must therefore risk tautology uh, and I think and say that the term media itself refers to the set of techno-social artifacts, I think we've already been hearing this all morning, uh, and processes that organize things into patterns and relational complexes that we can call infrastructures if we understand infrastructures uh, or infrastructure as that which repeats. So that's a little bit of an addendum, a footnote to, to the earlier discussion. Infrastructure is that which repeats. It's a kind of categorical imperative, imperative of infrastructure, repeat. Anyway, techno-social rather than merely, merely technical, not only to acknowledge the social production of technical things, but also, and again, risking tautology, to acknowledge the technical production of social relations. Okay. Now, this view modifies, but also, I think, ratifies the decontextualized Kitlerian aphorism, media determine our situation. Um, for it is not a question, this is, I think, where a lot of this, these problems about media determinism and technical determinism kind of run aground. It's not a question of linear mechanistic determination. Uh, rather, it's a question of differentiating among degrees of reciprocal determination, because we still need the question of causality on the table. Um, expanding the term media in this way, expand, and you get something that more plausibly determines our situation, uh, in the sense of material processes like organization, out of which those social relations emerge, and vice versa. So, you know, we clearly, there's a lot to talk about. Um, now, I, I do confess self-reference here, since Media Organized is also the thesis of the organizational complex. Um, this book that I published in 2003 as a work of media history disguised as a history of corporate architecture. Um, uh, which defines the organizational complex emergent in the post-World War II United States, primarily, uh, but not exclusively, uh, as the aesthetic and technological extension uh, of the military-industrial complex and maps its contours at the intersection, in this case, of architecture, cybernetics, and corporate sociability. So there, one important aim was to rearrange the assumptions of my own disciplinary home, um, by arguing that architecture uh, should be understood as one among many media. Um, moreover, that it, as such, it evinced a feedback-oriented, modular, pattern-based diagram uh, comparable to, but different from, Jeremy Bentham's much earlier Panopticon, in correspondence with the affective societies of control that Gilles Deleuze had argue, argued had by mid-century mid uh, begun to displace uh, the disciplinary society studied by Michel Foucault. Okay, all of these things you know very well. But organization is also a special type of material process, 
that, as the term suggests, uh, implies a type of intellectual work, an organon, uh, meeting a logic uh, and a practice. That, from Aristotle's early readers uh, to Francis Bacon, binds domains of knowledge or, or discourse into a coherent whole, like a university. Media as organon, then, constitute a system of legibility, a set of techniques that organize the discursive body as a body with organs uh, or integrated parts, the removal of any one of which would be traumatic. Recalling, then, the organon's early meaning, uh, we can call this body a curriculum, uh, a course of learning, and ask how it became incorporated. Among other things, this question opens on to the history of the corporate university, uh, the voice we heard last night, among other things, uh, which is of such concern uh, to us today. But before, for, be, before considering that question more directly and, and, and historically, um, I do want to remind you uh, that, that when Deleuze and Félix Guattari wrote of a body without organs, uh, they were quite specific, BWO, right? Uh, the, or, yeah. C-S-O in French, right? Um, the BWO is opposed uh, not to the organs, but to the organization of the organs called the organism. Mm -hmm. um, the organism, then, that was a quote. So the organism is what happens when the body enters the field of power, or what Deleuze and Guattari call, after Antonin Artaud, the judgment of God. From the perspective of the organizational complex, it, it is not accidental, uh, historically, uh, that the date of Artaud's pronouncement to have done with the judgment of God, this is where the concept comes from, uh, the date is precisely November 28th, 1947, which titles, you may remember the relevant chapter of Mille Plateau, that they, you know, they always use the dates as titles. Um, it's exactly coincident with the date, November 1947, that Norbert Wiener signed the introduction to his book, Cybernetics or Control and Communication in the Animal Machine, while a visiting faculty member at the National Institute of Cardiology in Mexico City. Um, for, as Wiener's institutional affiliation attests, cybernetics is nothing if not devoted to recovering the organism uh, as its object of cognition. At the very moment that its electromechanical techniques threatened that object with dissolution. So in that fateful introduction, uh, Wiener defines organization neg-entropically as follows, quote, just as the amount of information in a system is a measure of its degree of organization, so the entropy of a system is a measure of its degree of disorganization, uh, and the one is simply the negative of the other. This is sort of the classical definition. Encouraged in the Macy conferences by Gregory Bateson and Margaret Mead uh, to translate this principle into the domain of social organization, Wiener concedes that, quote, it is certainly true that the social system is an organization like the individual, that it is bound together by a system of communication, and that it has a dynamics in which circular processes of a feedback nature play an important part, end quote. He argues, however, that available statistical runs pertaining to human affairs are insufficiently long and insufficiently constant uh, to obtain reliable uh, results. He was actually pretty consistently against the sort of social scientific translation of cybernetics. Um, however, uh, as we know, this and other limitations were readily overcome or at least overlooked. Uh, and within a decade, the social sciences had, sciences had fully absorbed the cybernetic hypothesis. So, okay, so much is well known, you know, you know these things. Behind uh, all of this, however, is a theory of organized social life that I think bears closer scrutiny. In 1947, Wiener indicated his sympathy for those like Bateson and Mead who, quote, in the present age of confusion, so it's 1947, sought a cybernetic social science. Uh, several years later, he attempted as much himself in his beautifully titled rambling, Ramble, uh, The Human Use of Human Beings. It's, it, I mean, there is no better title. Uh, Cybernetics and Society, uh, 1950. And to the extent that this, this book has a focus, because if you've read it, you know that it rambles. Uh, 
is on the negantropic homeostatic function of cybernetic feedback systems. So there is a kind of recurrent uh, thesis. Among its most lucid sections is that devoted, it's a chapter called, the, called Organization as the Message, um, which, uh, from which it's just worth here, I don't know what, we're losing our, oh, come on. I like this, okay. Is it there now, is it back? Yeah, all right, we got it back. No? All right. Oh, okay. What do you prefer? No, whatever. Just leave it. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> Our machines. These machines, what they do to us. Um, anyway, okay, so here's a quotation from Norman Wiener. Uh, organization as the message. Quote, we have already seen that certain organisms, such as man, uh, tend for a time to maintain and often even to increase the level of their organization as a local enclave in the general stream of increasing entropy, of increasing chaos and de-differentiation. Life is an island here and now in a dying world. He was an optimist. The process by which we living beings resist the general stream of corruption and decay is known as homeostasis. So Wiener extrapolates a pattern-based informational type of homeostasis organization as the message from a, from a biological one, uh, comparing the biochemical maintenance of body temperature, for example, to the negative feedback devices of mechanical automata. It is not bodily tissue per se, but as he says, quote, the pattern, i.e. Uh, the organism in the deleuze uh, sense, the pattern maintained by this homeostasis, which is the touchstone of our personal identities. This is Wiener again. Um, quote, we are but whirlpools in, an ever, in a river of ever flowing water. We are not stuff that abides, but patterns that perpetuate themselves. End quote. So human beings and their societies are therefore, according to Norbert Wiener, transmiss transmissible messages born on an ever-changing material substrate that tends towards entropy. The problem in translating cybernetics to the social sciences then becomes one of converting the science of neuronal or electromechanical feedback into one of uh, pattern maintenance based on statistical data and computing capacity adequate to the organizational complexities of large collective bodies, i.e. societies, conceived as homeostatic organisms and applying it to that substrate. But if another name for pattern here is not just body, but subject, uh, so these patterns are also in some sense subjects, um, how are such patterns produced and maintained at the technosocial level, that is, at the level of media complexes? Well, also in 1947, we can almost hear Artaud, Antonin Artaud, shouting in protest against this organismic subject, whose authority short circuits the lib libidinal economy. So here's our toe from, from the, the radio play that Deleuze and Guattari quote from. Quote, when you will have made him a body without organs, then you will, have, you will have delivered him from all his automatic reactions and restored him to his true freedom. So Deleuze and Guattari's version of Artaud's BWO is therefore neither organic nor inorganic, but rather anorganic. Uh, really, it is several types of rather male bodies uh, that experiment on themselves, putting themselves at risk to become hypochondriac, paranoid, schizo, drugged, or masochist. Deleuze and Guattari quote Artaud again, quote, the body is the body, alone it stands, and in no need of organs. Organism, it never is. Organisms are the enemy of the body, end quote. Repeating the title of Artaud's radio play, they add, quote, now this is Deleuze and Guattari, uh, the judgment of God, the system of the judgment of God, the theological system is precisely the operation of he who makes an organism, an organization or organs uh, of organs called the organism. So organization and stratification then as primordial violence, the judgment of God, uh, final quote here, the BWO, the, again, Deleuze and Guattari, the BWO is that glacial reality where the alluvians, sedimentations, coagulations, foldings, and recoilings that compose an organism and also a signification and a subject occur. 
In short, the BWO is Norbert Wiener's river of ever-flowing water from which patterned organisms arise. As glacial reality, then, the BWO is not a medium. Like background noise in a communications channel, it is constitutively pre-medial. If we call media any apparatus uh, that organizes this noise into what they call, quote, alluvians, sedimentations, coagulations, foldings, and recoilings. Now here I deliberately use the Foucauldian term apparatus to be more precise about defining media not, or not at least exclusively as communication systems, but as organizational ones. In order now to address, uh, in sort of part two, in a highly attenuated fashion, uh, the emergence of the modern corporation as a political body, that is, an organized body, a system of power knowledge subject to the judgment of God from a media theoretical point of view. So, among the precursors to the corporations that would consolidate a cybernetic hegemony, the ones we just saw also, um, in the neoliberal world order, uh, are the research universities where a lot of that stuff started, uh, that developed and circulated the scientific and technological knowledge around which that hegemony was built. In the United States in particular, but again by no means exclusively, the curriculum of those universities, well, well and this is a more particular American hist uh, phenomenon historically, but, but it, it translates, uh, the curriculum of those universities was based initially on th that of the earlier residential colleges, uh, most of where in one of them, uh, literally actually, um, most, uh, most of which um, were founded under one of several Protestant uh, denominations and hence subject quite directly to the judgment of God. Through the 19th century, as these colleges grew unevenly into universities, the Protestant ethic by which they were governed was secularized, or so it is still said, um, with the incident supposedly, in other words, with the institutionalization of the scientific method, the new hegemony of number and calculability, the growth of vocational training, and the delinking of the humanities and the social sciences from the moral program of the church. By the 1920s, research universities seem therefore to be following the pattern, pattern of incorporation established by the great industrial concerns, railroads, oil companies, auto manufacturers, etc. Um, and becoming multi-headed bureaucracies. The result was a sort of manic Kafka-esque abstraction and compartmentalization of knowledge into academic departments, specialties, and subspecialties, uh, such that by 1947, uh, in other words, the production of expertise, by 1947, Norbert Wiener could exclaim of his colleagues, he's, here he is in cybernetics again, quote, a man may be a topologist or an acoustician or a coleopterist, uh, beetles, they study beetles. Um, he, will, he will be filled with the study, of, with the jargon of his field and will know all its literature and all its ramifications, but more, more frequently than not, he will regard the next subject as belonging to his colleague three doors down the corridor uh, and will consider any interest in it on his part as an unwarrantable, unwarrantable, unwarrantable uh, breach of privacy. So, and if you know the, anything about the MIT campus where, where Wiener worked, it's the infinite card, or is exactly what he's talking about. Knowledge, 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 knowledge. Nobody talking to one another. Uh, hence, he argued for, predictably, the interdisciplinary science of cybernetics on the basis, in this case, of its uh, moral necessity, uh, with which came, despite his own personal misgivings, actually, integration into the techno-social organism, which by 1970 had uh, been or was renamed the Military Industrial Educational Complex. Now, what this teleology leaves unexplained, however, is not only the fact that the small denominational colleges were themselves among the nation's first corporations, but also the news, which had already begun to spread, that, at, as Deleuze later put it, businesses or corporations, had souls. For contrary to the neo-Weberian thesis and closer to the premises of the Turing test, and I'll just say parenthetically, where the question is, uh, what kind of human, what kind of human, after all, can mistake a machine for another human? Um, corporations were computing machines 
precisely to the extent that they acquired organismic and eventually human attributes. So this is a little bit of an inversion of the, the thesis of rationalization. Um, an organismic and eventually human attributes, which in turn encouraged humans to regard them as fellow humans, or more specifically, as persons. In a two-way street of subjectivization, so, so we are in a sense, there's the, the, the sort of subject of, of corporate authority and the corporation itself are participating in this two-way street of subjectivization uh, that will ultimately compel us to ask, what kind of human can love a corporation? Now, by, I'll explain. Uh, by 1800, in the early American Republic, uh, corporations were regularly formed to enable collective action, uh, like building roads or establishing cities, semi-independently from the national state, which was, as now, uh, viewed by many with suspicion. Hence, the decades immediately following US independence saw the proliferating incorporation of towns turnpike authorities, so corporations were, were, were things like that really first. Towns, turnpike authorities, bridge companies, relig religious associations, colleges, schools, and many other such uh, institutions. During the long 19th century, uh, these corporations shifted uh, under the law from being conceived as mere vehicles for collective activity uh, uh, to being recognized as active agents with rights and responsibilities of their own. The basis of this agency is what has been called the legal fiction known as corporate personhood. And of course, this has become, in the American political sphere, uh, a fundamental concern with recent Supreme Court cases. And indeed, it is in the Supreme Court that, that this gets uh, most sort of classically articulated. So corporate personhood gained formal recognition in 1886 when in Santa Clara, in a case called Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad Company, so it's about infrastructure. Um, the Supreme Court, uh, two, two infrastructures kind of like challenging one another. Um, the Supreme Court ruled that corporations were entitled to equal protection under the law as provided to natural persons under the 14th Amendment, uh, uh, yeah, which had been ratified uh, in 1868 largely to secure equal treatment for freed slaves. Um, so this historical obscenity, because it is an obscenity, uh, was reaffirmed in 1910 when in Southern Railway Company versus Green, the court concluded, quote, that a corporation is a person with, within the meaning of the 14th Amendment is no longer open to discussion. So that was by 1910. And in 1926, uh, no, long, no less a figure than John Dewey uh, theorized uh, corporate personality as essentially a concrete performative. He wrote a very important uh, article on, on, on this, on corporate personhood. Um, legal historians have supplied partial uh, explanations as to how this came about, uh, but most of these, these explanations presuppose, contrary to uh, my former Columbia colleague Dewey, uh, who lived down the block from me, actually, uh, an ontological distinction between natural and artificial persons that is abrogated by force of law and hence construe corporate personhood as a species of literary personification. So they, 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 they in a sense, accept the premise of the fiction, of corporate fiction. But, I, you know, which is, I think, is a mistake, basically. That's the, the, the mistake. So, and do we recognize it? He re recognized the performative um, function. Uh, this is probably because nearly all such accounts are purely discursive. Uh, giving little sense of how the corporate person was or is materially constituted. So I'm, I'm just going to give a very quick sketch. I won't fill in all the, the sort of more specific technical details, but, but I'll try to give a sense of, of how that might occur. So the, the residential college uh, offers early entry into that process of the material constitution of the corporate person. Uh, in this case, in an 1819 uh, federal Supreme Court case known as Trustees of Dartmouth College versus Woodward, in which the court ruled that privately chartered institutions held contract rights comparable to those of private persons. Dartmouth College had been incorporated uh, in 1769 by means of a charter uh, granted by King, uh, King George III, as was typical uh, of the time. Most of these uh, institutions, including Brown, um, were uh, 18th century charters. Um, 
Although the initial largely unfulfilled purpose was to Christianize native tribal youth, that was the purpose of Dartmouth, um, the precariously founded new college was, like nearly all of its peers, actually devoted to the education of white Christian men. In 1816, in the aftermath of a conflict between president and trustees, the state of New Hampshire sought to revise the college's charter to place it under the administrative and curricular control of state government. So they attempted to turn it into a public institution. <clears throat> the trustees objected, um, arguing that this violated the contract clause of the US Constitution, uh, which prevents the state from impairing, quote, the obligations of contracts among private individuals or among individuals and the state. The court found that the charter amounted to, to such a contract, and hence the actions of the state, of the state of New Hampshire, in that case, were in violation of this constitutional clause. But if the already incorporated Dartmouth College was thereby recognized to bear the rights of a private individual, uh, the means by which that recognition, recognition was secured suggests that it entailed more than just a legal fiction. In his closing argument before the Supreme Court on behalf of Dartmouth College, Daniel Webster, who was a Dartmouth alumnus, uh, exclaimed of his alma mater quite famously to the presiding justice, John Marshall, that, quote, it is a small college, and yet there are those who love it. And that phrase resonated, needless to say. And yet there are those who love it. At which point Webster reportedly choked up, tears filling his eyes. Now, strategically successful as it was, and he, went, he did win the case, um, we can regard Webster's declaration of familial love for Dartmouth College as genuine. This is, I, I'm point, my point here is that this is not just a rhetorical ruse. Not because its apparent spontaneity testified to true feeling rather than calculation, per se, but because, as the court's decision bore out, the college had already become a body capable of eliciting human affect. The evidence for this at Dartmouth and at the other early colleges, uh, including Brown, is, is abundant and indisputable, but somewhat counterintuitive. By the time, for example, a well-known example, Daniel Chester French installed his sculpture of the goddess Athena on the steps of the new Columbia campus in 1904, uh, refiguring her as a proud but nurturing mother. Uh, it was unproblematic, expected even, to declare not only loyalty to, but love for one's alma mater. In Foucault's language, this too was discipline. Not only did it extrapolate the maternal domestic function during the Romantic and early Victorian period, periods of gendered training into literacy, or what Friedrich Kittler perhaps mischief, mischievously called the mother's mouth, um, not only did it extend the residential college's longstanding practice of in locus parentis uh, onto the whole university system, most importantly, it tolerated misbehavior, failure, and even delinquency, asking in return, or demanding really, only to be loved. Because remember that as Foucault emphasizes, delinquency is a product of the carceral apparatus rather than its antithesis. Uh, failure is therefore among that apparatus's prerequisites for proper functioning. In the sphere of education, a principal instrument for the distribution of failure, uh, as we all know, is the examination, the inaugural instance of which is the entrance examination. Upon arriving in Hanover, New Hampshire in 1797, for example, the 15-year-old Daniel Webster, 15 years old, um, had his knowledge of English, Greek, Latin, and arithmetic tested before uh, being allowed to enroll at Dartmouth. Such on-the-spot exams were common at the time, as was delinquent behavior once admitted. Uh, at Princeton, uh, then the College of New Jersey, for example, uh, Nassau Hall, the main building, uh, which, like Brown's own university hall, uh, dates from the late 18th century, uh, and I should add, like the building that we're in, which is later uh, and, and, and was built for the women's college, um, has had all the trappings of a good disciplinary apparatus. Um, enclosure or confinement, a system of cell cellular partitioning, distinct distinctly marked functional sites, and ranks, uh, both within room, rows of beds or desks, and among them by year, kind of uh, arrangements by year, uh, and so on. 
Likewise, class schedules, daily recitations, uh, the teaching of proper handwriting with proper posture, a student pen, paper, chair, desk interface, sort of mediatic interface, uh, and various prohibitions on time wasting uh, uh, and so on, uh, all defined according to the terms of infrastructural repetition. Repeat the recitation, come to class, and so on and so forth. Um, more than simply a building then, Nassau Hall was a media complex. As such, it was repeatedly the object of destructive behavior. Um, behaviors that itself must be construed as, instance, as, as an instant, uh, or instance or plural instances uh, of infrastructural repetition. So, for example, during the 1810s, uh, three students were expelled for exploding gunpowder in the building, uh, another for unforgivably ringing the belfry bell at 3 a.m., while another vandalized the Bible by cutting a deck of playing cards into its leaves, and others set off firecracker, firecrackers indoors and scrawled graffiti on the walls. A sequence that reached a climax of sorts when several students exploded a gunpowder-filled log inside the hall, um, only to be topped three years later by a group who nailed all the building's doors shut and shouted rebellion and fire. Now, anyone uh, who is even remotely aware of the sometimes violently sexualized emotions that simmer beneath the surface of collegiate life uh, will recognize this, this ritual misbehavior as more than just boys testing the patience of their surrogate parents. It may indeed be that, like Artaud, these student subjects wanting to be done with the judgment of God, uh, or at least of their parents, uh, are experimenting on the body of the college looking for ways to defeat it, to dismember it, even to make it into a body without organs. You'll, re you'll remember all the instructions that are given, the protoc protocols in the Deleuze and Guattari text, like closing things up. So. Um, but in so doing, they also affirm that body's personhood, uh, its organic machinic subjectivity. For I think ultimately this violence belongs to the order of male fantasy uh, that, as Klaus Tevelite showed us, mixes desire, fear, hatred, and love with a will to power focused on and through the technologically produced corporate organism. In the process, that organism becomes a real subject, um, such that, as Daniel Webster said, uh, there are necessarily those who love it. Like the news that businesses have souls, this should be enough to make us shudder. But what is most confusing in this case, and most troubling, uh, is that uh, as, it, as it began its long life as a legal person, the corporate organism was also an organon, uh, not so much a tool as a curriculum, a means for arranging and distributing knowledge, an information system, a logic, an educational, as well as a disciplinary apparatus. When we say that media organize, then, and go so far, uh, as I have at least to assert that the term media is even defined by this organizational function, we are speaking of an irreducible conflictual intermediality that runs, in this case, from paper to candlelight to recitation room to courtroom and well beyond. And if to organize is to distribute the background noise of a glacial reality, uh, a river of ever-flowing water, into a non-fictional organism, capable of bearing rights, being hated, and being loved, the field of incorporated bodies that recognize this organism and make it into a subject runs in a highly modulated continuum from oral examination, or job interview, as the case may be, to nocturnal outburst. Its organization uh, into patterns of power, knowledge, and desire is not legible outside the ensuing intermedial uh, interactions. Therefore, uh, the corporate person that is also an organon, which today we still call a university, warrants our closest attention while demanding with grim determination our deepest affection. Thank you.